Well, thanks everyone. It's, it's, thanks to Howard for inviting all of us here. It's, it's amazing to be part of this discussion, as Monica said, you know, so many wisdom researchers, so many different ideas. I'm actually going to do something similar to Monica, which is to focus in on a single study, a single approach, and as Bob said, sort of pitch this as an interesting way that we might look at um, studying wisdom. And of course, this is built around a lot of work that, say, you know, people in my lab are doing, in particular Nick Westrate, who's here with us, and um, Zaya and Feng, who's um, at the University of Toronto. So why exemplars? Well, I believe exemplars are the common currency of wisdom across cultures and across generations. Often people think about, say, wisdom, they think of particular people. And you can ask the question, well, then do other cultures, um, do they have different kinds of exemplars of wisdom than, than we do, or, or are they very much the same? But if they're different, then of course, explicit theorizing and measurement of wisdom in cross-cultural research might be premature. It might work very well here in North America, but when you go to other cultures, it may not work so well. So um, we're building from a small piece of an international study of personal wisdom that we've done <coughs> a few years ago. Uh, it had an international team, including Monica. Um, Alexander Bakal was in Serbia. Elena Ivan say <coughs> Ivanova in Ukraine. Rasul Kordnogabi in Iran. Rudavu in China. Rama Hollingham um, in India. And then many graduate students all who were listed here. Um, it was a mixed method design, so we had a standardized questionnaire, select the 3 WS, uh, the adult self-transcendent inventory, but then various measures of life satisfaction and well-being. Actually, I'm not going to really talk about most of that today. I'm going to focus in on the interview piece of it. <coughs> we had a general autobiography, and then wisdom exemplars, particular wise acquaintances you knew, and you asked, like, who's the wisest person you know, and why did you choose them? <coughs> you know, then a moment from your own life, but someone from history, and this is going to be the focus of this talk. Uh, what's one story you know about them that shows them to be wise? And then a general definition. So if you just go with that, and then of course we had about 100 people in each uh, country, several countries. I'm going to focus on the USA, Canada, and China. <coughs> but I have something to say about Iran. I couldn't fit into 10 minutes, so if people are interested, um, I'll say a little bit afterwards. So here's uh, North America, we find in general, we say this is commonly found. Um, many more male exemplars are nominated than, than female. And what are the domains of fame or sort of you know, reasons why they'd be nominated? Often it's politics, uh, social activism, spiri spirituality and religion, and uh, philosophy and science. Those are the, the main themes. A little bit of art and culture, but you see that um, although you get 30 uh, exemplars, but really it's 32 people who have nominated them. So there's it's much more sort of like um, off-the-cuff type of nominee. Interestingly, we had 85 people nominate uh, martyrs, but they had only 10 exemplars, so they had sort of 10 critical mm -hmm. martyrs they're thinking of. Say we say uh, published this paper uh, this year with uh, Nick Westrate as the key uh, lead author, and Monica as second author, or one of the authors. <coughs> so we had three main groups. Um, so uh, practical wisdom, uh, benevolent wisdom, and uh, philosophical wisdom. Now, what those basically mean is that practical, as you see, is largely political. Benevolent people who are sort of devoted to s uh, social service. And, um, but we also have Jesus, the founder of Christianity in there. And then philosophical is a very broad category. We have Einstein and Solomon <laughs> sort of falling into the same broad category in Socrates. Now, looking at this um, historically, you find a really wide range, so almost 3,000 years, say, that people are drawing from. We've got Solomon, who's, um, you know, 990 BCE, all the way, oh, this uh, unfortunately is cut off at the bottom. But the last person is um, Barack Obama, the current president of the U.S., US. <laughs> a very polarizing figure. So some, many people nominated him, other people um, actually sort of did, did not want to choose him. <coughs> so if you look at the top four, we have Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Jesus, um, Abraham Lincoln, and Winston Churchill. Now this combines the U.S. and Canada as a sample. If you go actually to um, Canada versus the U.S., you find actually we have a similar cast of characters, but um, not exactly the same weighting. So Mahatma Gandhi and Jesus are somewhat pretty evenly divided. But of course, Abraham Lincoln is predominantly a U.S. sort of a choice as a, an exemplar. Um, whereas uh, Martin Luther King, also more in the U.S., although quite a few nominees. Uh, Winston Churchill, of course, is much more predominantly um, in the Canadian uh, sort of camp. So, well, what can we conclude from this? 
basically, you have these three main uh, groups, and you know, the, the reasons why that they're being chosen are often um, for particular reasons. So Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, <coughs> obviously founders of uh, the American Republic are critical uh, figures in that. Mahatma Gandhi is a, also, say, a political figure. I also want to draw your attention to, to the fact that all four of the top nominees are martyrs, uh, so in this North American sample. Okay, well, let's consider the Chinese wisdom exemplars. Here we find that, again, you have more um, male than female exemplars, <coughs> but here the main, one of the main themes is public service, um, which are mostly nominees of exemplary lower-ranking Communist Party members, people who serve the public, serve the public good. <coughs> Another main category is rulers, especially emperors and warlords. Um, and then a third big category but with many fewer exemplars are strategists, people who are just very good um, in terms of their strategic people like Zhu Liang. <coughs> and then we have um, sages, prophets, philosophers, a very broad category, which includes people like uh, the Buddha, but, uh, Lao Tzu, <coughs> and um, you know, people like Wittgenstein uh, were put into the same category. Scientists and scholars. And then you also have arts, but in this case now we have poets, calligraphers, artists um, as our, let's say, in our category. And here again we have a very wide range of, say, over 2,000 years span. Here what's interesting, now if you compare older and younger generations, we find that, um, Sure, Confucius sort of springs to mind here in the West, but really it's the younger generation that mostly nominates him. <coughs> we have several emperors. Uh, Su Ji is a sort of scholar and statesman from the, the Song Dynasty, but there again, it's uniquely the younger people who are nominating him. <coughs> now, if you go down, we find that the bottom of the list, the bottom five, are actually all communist chairmen and premiers, but it's mostly the older generation who are nominating these, especially Mao Zedong and Zhu Enlai, who are pivotal figures for their own in their own lifetimes. So we find both generational differences, although certain, certain commonalities uh, in the figures. You know, Mao, let's say, Zhu Enlai, it's not as though they're unknown to the younger generation. So we have similar broad categories, but um, you know, military political leaders seems very much like the practic practical scholars, philosophical. Benevolence is much more um, and nationally patriotic, so public service seems like the main theme that's going to come out here. Um, and we have differences across the generations. Now, I wanted to do another look at, at Gandhi. So, and in particular, we can ask, why was Gandhi wise? Well, of course, he's the top nominee in uh, North America in our study, but also in earlier work by Paul House, but also in a sample of Indian immigrants that we had to, um, to Toronto and Indian nationals from Gujarat, say Gandhi's home province. These are all young adults, actually. Now, if you take our three main prototypes, we find that um, really the Indian nationals are not so emphasizing the philosophical aspects of uh, Gandhi's wisdom, much more the benevolence, and that's really sort of shared with the immigrants. But look at the last category, which is that we find that a third of Canadians have asked, like, why did you choose Gandhi? They're like, oh, well, now you've stumped me. <laughs> I don't really <laughs> know that much about Gandhi. I just picked him, really. <laughs> um, so uh, that never happens for the Indian nationals. If you look more carefully at the, um, sort of the, the, the type of knowledge they draw on, we have sort of concepts like he was a freedom fighter, or Ahimsa, this idea of nonviolence. Um, so that we have some things like that for Canada. We have many more among the immigrants. But the real focus is... Um, for, say, among the Indian nationals, they have a, a wider range, really, than um, Canadians do, <coughs> and even the immigrants. In terms of chronicles, which are just one-off events that happened in Gandhi's life, we find that, you know, Canada, there's, you know, dietary restrictions, hunger strike, many more among the immigrants. For the Indian nationals, it's really independence. That's the main thing they, that they mm -hmm. strike, they emphasize. But then stories, which are full-fledged stories about um, Gandhi, uh, as one example, stopped eating sugar, uh, you know, a father came to, to Gandhi to say that he was, um, his son wasn't eating, you know, he, eating too much sugar. Uh, you know, Gandhi said, okay, come back tomorrow. That day he stopped eating <laughs> so too much sugar, and then he was able to advise, you know, based on his own, his own life. So this type of story, only the Indian nationals um, had it. A depth of knowledge, we find that, we can see that 
if you ask, is Gandhi part of a list? You know, one of many people nominated. It was about 50-50 in Canada, but much less so among um, Indian nationals. Do they have evidence? A again, Canada about 50-50, but among both immigrants and the nationals, there's much uh, less of, of that. They really, ha they, they do have evidence. Even in terms of personal impact for the nationals, you see much greater personal impact of Gandhi on their lives. <coughs> and strikingly, does it match their own personal definition of wisdom? Here we find 50% of Canadians say yes, but one, only 1% 1 of the Indian nationals. And we take that to be that he's just a placeholder for them, for a much more general abstract idea of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the Indians, they really know Gandhi and they're taking him, sort of, his life as exemplary. <coughs> so conclusion um, suggests that there's evidence for these three uh, prototypes of wisdom in North America. They play out differently in China, say. <coughs> they're the same broad prototypes, but manifesting very differently, um, differently across generations, as well as across, um, you know, sort of in terms of the specifics of the prototypes themselves. And I guess my point is really that I think that it's very interesting to consider these types of prototypes and the reasons why people choose them um, as a way into the, the study of uh, uh, wisdom in different cultures. And especially if we consider the depth of, of knowledge people have and the reason, say, uh, the impact it has on their own life. And so that's, uh, I'll close there, but that, that was the main point I wanted to make. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, so I had a question about the last uh, item in your interview. So, you know, your, what is your definition mm. of wisdom? The open-ended mm. question. Yeah. And, and one question I had thought about, you know, when you ask your average jo Joe, right, what is mm. wisdom? Mm. I'm wondering whether they would think that wisdom would be synonymous with morality. So a wise mm. person, a moral person. Mm. And it might be that depending on which prototype you're more likely to pick, right? So I'm mm -hmm. assuming they're going to be, and I say for your, your paper that you found individual differences in mm. who you were most likely to pick. Mm -hmm. um, that depe that depending on which prototype you're more likely to mm. go towards, mm. your definition of wisdom would mm. probably map on uh, closely mm. to morality. So did you find evidence mm. for that when you looked at the mm. definitions that oh. people provided? Yeah, we're still going through that, but basically um, the whole logic of this design was that rather than just ask out of the gate, like, as you say, just ask somebody, what is wisdom? I mean, you're it's very hard to sort of answer that type of question, but now they've just spent you know, half an hour sort of giving examples um, you know, from people they know, their own life, history. And so they've had a lot of time to sort of, um, I guess, if you want, prime for this. And then, of course, you know, the, the definition that you said that people then give at the end of this is very much a sort of synthesis of uh, the types of things that they, they said. And sure, many times it's exactly um, in line with what uh, the, the sort of examples that they've, they've chosen, because those examples sort of help them think about what I'm... Um, Oh, hi. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, so really interesting. One of the things, though, that I kind of noticed during the presentation, particularly at one point, is um, when you were talking about Gandhi, you mentioned mm. that particularly for the Canadians, when mm. asked why did they offer mm. Gandhi as an exemplar of wisdom, mm. Mm. you know, mm. like a third of them were like, eh, mm. you know, I did. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a little bit interested, worried mm. that in some sense, if they can't give a description of why they think that person is wise, they might just be offering it because they've been told that person was wise. Mm. In my case, when you first said that you were asking people, you know, give an example of wisdom, the person I thought of was Socrates. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually a little bit worried, mm -hmm. thinking back on my decision, that the reason I would offer that is because I was a philosophy student and it was mm. drilled into my head, Socrates is mm. wise. It'd actually be very difficult for me to give like mm. really concrete reasons for it. Mm. So. I'm, it's a little worrying because it's, that's not so much people thinking that person is wise, that's someone being told that that person is wise, mm. but not actually understanding what wisdom is. So I'm wondering mm. if you are concerned <coughs> about that or potentially <coughs> do you get different results when you just look at the people who uh, give good reasons? No, well certainly, like, and actually in terms of really looking at the um, understanding of wisdom, that are generated by different groups. Like the, these people who, the, the one third of people who just nominated Gandhi but could, had nothing codable to say about him, then they get, they get ruled out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of, a, of, our, of our sample. But I just thought it was really interesting 
as just to document the fact that there are many more of those people in Canada, whereas in India there are, no, there are none of those people. <laughs> it means that everybody who's like, if they chose him, they'd really have something articulate to say about him. So um, I think, and as you, we made it a little bit easier in the sense that we said one story you know or something that exemplifies his wisdom. So we're not actually asking them to give a definition or a reason. It could be much more difficult, but if you really can't even think of a sort of story or example or something like that, then it shows that, as you say, it's like somebody just mentioned Gandhi, it, it, it's front of mind for you, but you don't, uh, you don't have a lot more depth of thought behind it than, um, than just the name. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that is true, and uh, I guess it's a, it is a, a worry. But the main point I was trying to make is that these types, these figures are sort of coordinates for us, like in, you know, in understanding wisdom, even in terms of, I think, you know, people were nominated, the way people were nominated, or even the type of reasoning they do, the sort of personality they have. I think in different cultures, they can sort of give a, a, a landscape. Um, and in that sense, they become very widely known, the top nominees. And some people will know a lot more about them, others, um, others less, but yeah. they, they sort of help situate the debate of around wisdom. I do just, it's a little tiny yeah. follow-up, mm -hmm. I do just worry a little bit, though, that yeah. potentially, people's conceptualization, like if you, you really pry them into like what do they think is wise, mm. it might be the case that it doesn't align with these figures. Mm. So they're saying the figure because it comes to mind, but mm. if you actually pry them on what they think is a, like a wise person is, it might not actually be mm. the same thing. Well, the thing is that, the, but they've nominated this person and for you know, reasons or examples that they can give. So if that were true, it would, come out to them as they're talking, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it would already be, and so some people do actually say that, you know, I've some, so in somebody would say, uh, like one of the categories was challenge Gandhi. I was going to say Gandhi, but then I learned that he's a racist, so I guess I'm gonna have to rule him out. <laughs> you know, there are people that, you know, have that kind of a response. You know, so they're, I think people are checking themselves as, they're, as they are answering. Mm. And it, so I, I think it, it, it's very quite relatively rare, it happens in only one or two cases, but people actually do sort of monitor the quality of their response as they're, as they're speaking. So I, th I think that although it's true in the sense in which it's, a, it's, you know, potentially a worry, but I don't think that people, c because it's part of a conversation, you know, that they, um, they don't really um, let that s their initial sort of choice stand, even if they themselves come up with some objection to it as they get go along. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh -huh. uh, hi, Michelle. Hi. <laughs> Um, I enjoyed your talk. I did have one concern. Mm. In the talk, mm. you seem to draw a very vague boundary, if any, between wisdom and implicit theories of wisdom. Mm. And I would mm. think that your talk is about implicit theories of wisdom, but mm. not mm. necessarily about wisdom. Uh, as an example, mm. I noticed <coughs> that in China, uh, a lot of people enlisted uh, Mao Zedong, mm. and one can understand why, but he, you know, from most historical accounts, he was responsible for the deaths of millions of people mm. of his own country mm. and made serious mistakes, I mean, mm. really serious mistakes like the Cultural Revolution, which mm -hmm. set the country back I I enormously. Mm. So, and one could imagine in 50 years or maybe one year, mm. uh, Trump being on the list. Uh, mm. and, right. and, and so my concern is that it's really important to distinguish between what people, who people think is wise, or what they think it is, and what the construct is, unless the person uh, who is most, you know, visible or uh, you know, sort of uh, the first to come to mind, be becomes labeled as wise, even though he might have been a total fool. No, that's a great point, but and I think it's true that there's a danger to take these people a whole cloth as um, exemplars of wisdom. So someone like, like Mao is a perfect example. <laughs> Even in China and among the older generation, when people speak about Mao, um, they'll say something like, like one person said, um, well, you know, I think we should give him 70% credit and 30% blame because of the mistakes he made in his later life were so great and set us back such a long way. But, you know, but there, then th they'll pick a few instances of his life that are exemplary of wisdom. And those things, so for example, you know, one that sprung to mind is that he defeated an army of, I think it was like, you know, 200 or 2,000, you know, you know, real you know, armed people with, you know, seven fake guns. <laughs> you know, so that type of, uh, that's the same type of story as somebody else gave for uh, Zhugoliang from history, in which he defended a fortress uh, just by bluffing his way out of a, a situation. So you get a sense of what, 
what constitutes wisdom um, in, you know, and this, this is more of like a strategist say, example of wisdom, then um, from these examples, and people don't try and make the entire sort of life of the character um, to, be, to be wise, but rather just moments that, that, they, that they're considered to be particularly exemplary of. Well, uh, well, the no, precisely, and actually in the Ukraine, Stalin is listed as one of the key wisdom figures. I know, so, <laughs> I mean, so when you're sitting here in North America, you're like, Stalin, <laughs> how can he be you know, listed as a, a wisdom figure? But, so, I mean, to me, that's actually one of the most striking things about this project, is that you know, characters who we would never sort of like nominate, but, uh, but there become a top nominee, and, but for reasons that, you know, very selective uh, sort of you know, choice of moments in their life or things that they've done or aspects of them, uh, you know, of, of their full biography. So, no, I think that's a very important qualification, precisely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.